Assalamualaikum students. हम अपना ये जो course है literary forms and movement ये discuss कर रहे हैं. और obviously at this stage it is a basic course for you guys, so that you might be able to understand uh, what are the basic forms of literature and then obviously we'll go toward movements as well, जो basic trends रहे हैं. क्योंकि obviously जब literature लिखा जाता है तो लिटरेचर एज इट सेल्फ अ स्पेशल फॉर्म है हमने स्टार्ट में भी डिस्कस किया था इट इज अ स्पेशल फॉर्म ऑफ आर्ट एंड उसके साथ में हम ये भी इसमें डिस्कस करते हैं कि इसमें अभी डिफरेंट ट्रेंड्स आते हैं डिफरेंट थॉट पैटर्न चलते हैं और ये सारी चीजें यू मस्ट बी अंडरस्टैंडिंग दैट वेल वी टॉक अबाउट लिटरेचर वी टॉक अबाउट पोइट्री वी टॉक अबाउट ड्रामा फिक्शन राइट दीज आर लाइक मेन you can say the forms of literature and every form has its own particular style particular uh, expression particular themes as well jaise for example hum poetry ke bare mein baat karte hain to poetry jo hai it is considered as something imaginative something highly reflective something deep something unusual that's why poetry has always been a superior place in the uh, genres of literature and then we talk about drama drama is mostly related with action right that's why it is in dialogue form there is no room for speculation there is no room for imaginative kind of things because obviously action is based upon uh, those things which are less imaginative and more action related and then fiction is a comprehensive representation of life it has a higher scope it it, it can include dramatic elements in it it can include poetic elements in it and obviously it is about life generally life right while poetry is specific right fiction can become general so that's why we so in the form we have discussed so far certain elements of metrical composition we have discussed different figures of speech imagery right all these kind of thing which we normally use in poetry so these things we have been discussing today in our topic we are going to discuss a couple of poems by some famous uh, poets and in those poems we are going to apply for example uh, imagery or symbolism or uh, metrical composition like rhyme scheme these things so that you might be understanding it right so now i'm sharing screen so all of you uh, you should be like doing this so aap mujhe batayenge ki ye aapko nazar aa raha hai screen par is it like uh, visible to all of you the daffodils by william wordsworth reply me aapko ye nazar aa rahi hai screen share sabko एक्सपीरियंस because poet obviously is sensitive right poet has a higher level of imagination and from a very simple thing jisko agar main ya aap dekhe from a common point of view to hame usme wo beauty ya wo thoughts nazar nahi aaye jo ki for example ek poet jo hai wo usme imagine kar sakta hai so that's why ek ye cheez bhi aap dekh rahe ho sab ke sab so uske baad hum is poem ka padhte hain right and when we will read it so we will understand that ke uh, how for example symbols have been used how for example the the, the words the, the lines how they have been arranged right so let's start that uh, wandered lonely as a cloud right so that floats on high over vales and hills the poet is comparing himself here you can see the use of simile in the very first line that he is comparing himself with the, with the cloud right and that cloud obviously is wandering over the hills and over the vales valleys and hills when all at at once i saw a crowd 
and Wordsworth was, you can say, he, he has a special love for nature, right? And in his poetry, we find that he finds himself in a direct kind of uh, a relationship with nature and he finds himself as an extension of nature. That's why he compares uh, himself uh, with the objects of nature. For example, cloud. So cloud is an object of nature. It's a beautiful object and it's like uh, uh, movement hai. Wo independent hai aur wo move kar raha hai. So he is like consider himself that he was like wandering in the company of nature. He was wandering in some valley like a cloud. And all at, uh, all at once he saw a crowd, right? So the crowd again, you can see a sort of personification, for example, because a crowd is usually used for human beings, right? So when you give human qualities, the qualities of human emotion or human, or you present some natural object as a person, as human beings, so that is called personification. So we see that given all at once, I saw a crowd, a host, and then the other word he used, a host. Host is obviously another kind of thing, another personification, because obviously host is used for human beings. But here those daffodils, right, which he obviously telling in the next lines. So uh, the daffodils, right, which he told of golden daffodils, a host of golden daffodils. So here, for example, if the daffodils are host, right, then who is guest? Wordsworth is guest, the poet is guest, right? So nature is host and the human being is guest. So beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So you could see in this uh, beautiful lines that beside the lake, those daffodils, the host of daffodils, I mean there are many daffodils. And where they were, they were beside the lake, there is a lake, right, beneath the trees, and there, there are trees as well, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, right? So again, dancing is uh, again personification because the poet is giving human feelings, human dance, human feelings to flowers. So again, you see now uh, this paragraph is stanza ko sorry dubara agar aap dekhen. The wonder lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills when all at once I saw a crowd. A host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Uh, for example, uh, you know, just find yourself that as Wordsworth is trying to show you that uh, company of daffodils that the daffodils flowers over there so he he, he sketches right like like a verbal painting uh, and he points out that he was like wandering in in a valley and there were hills and all at once suddenly as uh, something just just to dramatize the thing all at once the phrase this all at once is used to dramatize is to uh, seek your attention as well that i saw a crowd a oh, crowd a host and then the other word of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So the simple phenomena of some flowers, right, who are in some valley, obviously in natural uh, environment, we find these flowers. But you see that that he has dramatized this, this scene. He has not only dramatized, but beautified these scenes as well. Right. And now you started to imagine that as you are in some valley, right, and it's like a beautiful valley and there are hills and then you are near some lake, right, and there are trees and then beside the lake and beneath the trees, there are certain flower, there is breeze going on, obviously it's a beautiful feeling when we, uh, we, we, we feel breeze. And in that breeze, right, as you would also like to flutter and dance, so those flowers are fluttering and dancing, right? So you see that the imagination, the thought, right, the imagery, right? You could, you could, you could see certain images, for example, the image of cloud moving, the image of whales and hills, right? The image of those daffodil, image of lake, image of trees, and then that image of fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So this is uh, what poet, uh, which poets do. They create a beautiful imagery. And in this way, uh, they seek our attention. They give us an, an experience of beauty, right? So that's why 
uh, this this whole scene becomes so beautiful. From metrical composition, we have the rhyme scheme. Ki baat ki thi, ke, for example, we have to arrange it. So, you can see the rhyme scheme. Ko for example, cloud is given, so you can give it a name. We have to give it a name. We have to name. We have to name. We have to give it a name. We have to give it a name. We have to give it a name. Right? And then uh, the second jo aapki line hai, uska jo word hai, wo hills hai. So, hills obviously cloud is a different sound. Hai. So, let's give it a name of B. Right? So, A, B. Then you see that the word crowd. Jo hai third line mein, last word crowd, it rhymes with the first line ka jo last word hai, cloud. So we call it A and then daffodils, right? Hills and dills, right? So they rhyme with each other. So we gave it name B. So the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B. And then there is in the uh, fifth line, beside the lake, beneath the trees. Now we have a new word, new sound word, trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So trees and breeze rhyme with each other. So we give them name A, B, C, C, right? So rhyme scheme of this stands up these six lines. It becomes A, B, A, B, and C, C. So in the next stanza, we again go and we see that continuous as the stars that shine, right? So here you can see a sort of hyperbole, a sort, sort of exaggeration. Why poets use exaggeration? Why poets use hyperbole? So that they, 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 they present a dramatized picture, right? So that your attention may be, as for example, when we in the night see the sky and there are like so many stars, right? So similarly, he is uh, pointing out that uh, the beauty of daffodils, that when he was looking at them, they were so vast, they, they look like continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, right? So Milky Way is the name of our galaxy. You understand this? The so twinkle is like another sound, uh, twinkling of the stars, sorry, that, that, uh, that, that shine. So those flowers, first of all, they were, uh, as a, they, they were as continuous as the stars that shine. And then obviously they were twinkling as well, right? They were shining as well as the stars shine in the sky in the night. So similarly, uh, these daffodils, they were first as numerous, as continuous as their stars, right? Numberless. And then they were shining as well. They stretched in never ending line along the margin of a bay, right? So this never ending line, again, you can see it's again a sort of exaggeration, sort of hyperbole, a never ending line. Obviously, a line always ends somewhere, but the poet is pointing the enormousness or the vastness or the huge number of those flowers that they stretched in never ending line. Along the margin of a bay. 10,000 saw I at a glass. Right? That as I saw, I saw 10,000 flowers. Obviously, uh, he would not have counted that, right? But it is like the uh, idea, the impression, the expression of the poet that he is uh, describing the beauty and he's exaggerating it. Obviously, ye uh, hamara ek local experience bhi hota hai. It's also a kind of natural thing that when we are admiring some beauty, so obviously beauty is a qualitative idea, so we don't have any typical or quantitative numbers in beauty. You can't say that this flower or this, this particular beauty is like, let's say, 5 kilo beautiful or 10 kilo beautiful. Right? We cannot use a unit. Right? So that's why uh, then obviously uh, we use imagination, we use adjectives, we use words, right? We, 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 we go with a certain exaggeration. So 10,000 saw I at a glance tossing their heads in sprightly dance, right? So tossing their heads in sprightly dance. Again, this uh, tossing their heads is a personification, right? In sprightly, sprightly, get then lively when you are very much happy, when you are like uh, full of excitement, full of energy. So, all those daffodils, all those flowers, they were tossing their heads in sprightly dance. So, here you could see in these uh, next second stanza, right? 
So he described the number of the stars to describe the number of stars. Again, he uses imagery and you can see that imagery, for example, in the form of stars, continuous as the stars that shine. They were as continuous as the stars, right? And then shine and twinkle on the Milky Way as those in the stars in the sky, they shine and twinkle and we see them. So he's using uh, two things in one in these two lines that first of all, those daffodils are as numberless as those stars are. And then those daffodils are also shining and twinkling as the stars shine in the sky. And then they stretched in never ending line along the margin of a bay. 10,000 I saw at a glance tossing their heads in sprightly dance. So again, if you iski ye jo aapka hai, uh, in, in this stanza, you could see uh, some personification, right? Then obviously exaggeration, hyperbole bhi aap isme dekh rahe hain. And then you could see, for example, rhyme scheme, if we iski banana chahe, is ki, achha, hum isko continuous bhi bana sakte hain, jaise hum wahan par A, B, A, B, C, C me aaye the. यहां पर हम इसको आगे भी चल सकते हैं और इसकी हम अलग-अलग से भी बना सकते हैं स्टेंजा की फॉर एग्जांपल जैसे शाइन वर्ड है तो शाइन इज ऑब्वियसली इज नॉट यूज्ड सो वी कैन गिव इट नेम डी देन वे है तो वे हैज आल्सो बीन नॉट यूज्ड सो वी कैन गिव इट नेम ई एंड देन लाइन एंड बे दे विल राइम विद शाइन एंड वे सो अगेन डी ई डी ई ग्लैंस एंड डांस दे राइम विद ईच अदर सो वी कैन नेम देम एफ एंड एज फॉर एग्जांपल simple jo aapka uh, ha, is stanza ke alada se banana chahoge so then that same pattern hai ke uh, this is a six line stanza and the six line stanza first four lines jo hain wo alternatively ek dusre ke sath rhyme karti hain aur last two lines jo hain wo continuously ek dusre ke sath rhyme karti hain jaise for example shine is a shine rhymes with line way rhymes with bay and class and dance rhyme with each other is it clear? clear I would like you to respond. Do you understand Okay. So next, uh, um, just stand up. The waves beside them danced, right? Now, obviously, as, for example, it is in the lake, right? So there you could see that key. The waves beside them danced. Even the waves, ye bhi personification hai. Kyunki jab bhi aap dekhenge ki, for example, when jo human feelings hain, ya human, human ke taur pe present kiya jata hai, ya human feelings hain. So unko jab aap poetry mein use karte hain, that is called as personification. Right? So ye humans bana ke pesh kiya ja rahe hain, jo aapki daffodils hain. And then now waves. So waves, the movement of waves, hai, aap ne agar waves dekhi, to obviously unke ek movement hoti hai, right? So the poet is using word dance for them because dance is obviously rhythmic, it's beautiful, right? So the waves beside them dance, but they outdid the sparkly waves in glee, right? But those, uh, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. So obviously waves are also sparkling, shining, twinkling. Right, but the poet is of the opinion that the daffodils say they were outshining those waves. Glee, obviously, the word used for shine. A poet could not but be gay, right? A poet is obviously very much happy to see such a beautiful scene. Which in the next line he say, in such a jocund company, a poet could not but be gay. In such a jocund company, I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought, right? So he says that when I, I obviously, what else a poet needs? Poet needs a beautiful experience and he was having this beautiful experience. And at that time he was like dazed by that amazing beauty. He was like so much uh, in, enjoying the, the, the sight of uh, those daffodils that he could not thought that he said that I didn't think anything. I was just like, enjoying and relishing the beauty of those uh, flowers, right? I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought, that what wealth this show, this beautiful scene, this beautiful view of daffodils, what they have brought to me. So I was like having, uh, he was having a, a time of his life, right? So again, in this particular stanza, you can again see uh, certain personification and then obviously 
this comparison that the poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company, in such a happy company, in such a sprightly, beautiful company. And then when he was in this company, he was not thinking about any philosophical idea. He was not thinking about anything. He was only gazing, right? The word gaze is used when you are like dazed by some beauty, right? And you enjoy it. And then in the uh, next stanza, for oft when on, on my couch I lie, even after that experience, when he has gone back to his life, he has gone back to his routine, right? So even in that routine, uh, we see that uh, uh, he says that even on my on my couch I lie, right? So when he recalls that experience, in vacant or in pensive moods, when he is like doing nothing or he is a bit pensive, he is a bit low, or he is a bit uh, uh, sad, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. Solitude. So they, those flowers, when he's like, after after so many days, after even years, when he has, uh, uh, he's alone and he's uh, doing nothing and he's a bit sad and a bit, uh, or in a bit recursive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude, right? So those flowers, right? They flash upon that inward eye, right? He feels that inward eye, joy kap ke mind ki, and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with daffodils. So when I am alone and I recall that beautiful experience, so my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. So, so uh, this is the end of the poem, right? So uh, the paraphrase is there, you can read it. But you understand that this is how poet uh, will get either in the on this screen, let me just explain. The stanza form, the poet consists of four six-line stanza. The poem consists of four six-line stanza. So the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, C, Abhar, which is stanza. You can understand the rhyme scheme in this way. The meter is iambic pentameter. It means that every line of the poem is, it, is, it, is, it consists of ten meters is come up to next me explain karunga and then figures of speech for example this is what as a student of literature as a student of uh, literature abhi aap zari bate in the early stage hai aapki to this is how you uh, uh, approach a poem right and in that you want to understand that what is like the meaning of the poem what poets want to say and then obviously Certain figures of speech, for example, just ye jahan par humne ek saast mein aapko bata bhi raha tha. I wondered, a lonely as a cloud is a simile, as like as humne pada tha simile mein. I saw a crowd, it's a personification, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So dancing in the breeze is another personification. Continuous as the stars that shine, simile obviously. This stretched and never ending line is a hyperbole. Tossing their heads in sprightly dance is personification. The waves beside them dance, again personification. They flash upon that inward eye, obviously, uh, those flowers, it's again personification. And dances with the daffodils, again personification. And then theme, obviously, nature as man's companion, healer, and comforter, right? So that would be uh, the end of this poem and uh, the purpose of uh, teaching this poem to you guys was to, to tell you that how, for example, poets uh, apply the certain devices Obviously, there would be many more as well. You can find out. Uh, I'll give you as a, as a homework. Or what other uh, figures of speech you could find and then, for example, you can look for alliteration, right, you could look for assonance, and then comparison and contrast, different techniques, obviously, there are in uh, applied in poetry. So that would be all uh, for today. If you want to ask any question, you can unmute your ma uh, mics and uh, you can ask anything if you want to ask. Yes, class, open up. <clears throat> So is everything clear? Are you guys there? Yes, sir. Everything clear? Yeah. Okay, great then. 
मैं ये स्क्रीन शेयर आपका बंद कर रहा हूँ राइट right? आपको क्वेश्चन पूछने हैं तो आप मुझसे पूछ सकते हैं <coughs> Okay, so no questions. Very good then. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. I will read the next poem. You have this uh, uh, presentation with you. You can see, and then obviously we'll be discussing certain other application of the devices which we have read so far. Okay. Take care, Allah Hafiz.